Good evening and welcome to our Bible study here in Ballyclare Evangelical Presbyterian Church. If you're able to join with us this evening, you're most welcome indeed. We'll turn to God and we'll seek his face. Let us pray. Our gracious God, our loving Father in heaven, we thank you that at the end of the day we can turn to you, that we can know that you care for us that we can be assured that beneath us are those everlasting arms that will never let us go. And to know the price that you are willing to pay for our salvation in Jesus Christ. We thank you for him. We thank you for that gift of love. We pray that our hearts would be taken with him and overwhelmed and that we would know the joy of wonderful salvation. Be with us for our Bible study now and cause your face to shine upon us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, we've been um, looking in recent weeks into um, a short passage in John and chapter 15, and I'm going to read that short passage again this evening, John 15 and verses 1 to 8. Let us hear God's word. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burnt. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit fruit. So you will be my disciples. And we thank God for the reading of his holy word. We're going to turn to God now in prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious God, our loving Father in heaven, we bow in your most holy presence. We acknowledge that you are that one before whom the host on high in glory calls out continuously, holy, holy, holy. And we recognize, O oh God, that you are the, the holy God and that we are an unholy people. We need your forgiveness. We need your pardon. We need you to cleanse us from sin. And we need you to teach our hearts the pathways of holiness, to love the Lord our God and to hate those things that um, displease the Lord our God. We pray that you would come amidst us now and have dealings with our hearts. And we pray that we would never be content, O oh God, with some outward performance, with some outward appearance, but, O oh God, that we would long to love you with our whole heart and that fervently. Have dealings with our hearts tonight, we pray. Thank you for the day that has passed. Thank you, O oh God, for everything that we've been able to do and to enjoy and for our families, for our friends, for our homes, for all that goes into the, the lives that we enjoy, O oh God. We know that these lives are of your kindness and love, that we deserve nothing of love, nothing of kindness, but we uh, pray, O oh God, that you would remember us with mercy and with pardon. Bless us for um, this Bible study then, and uh, may your word enter our hearts and have dealings with us. To remember those in need in our congregation, those who find themselves in a certain measure of trouble and difficulty, we commend them each and every one to you. Remember your believing church wherever she is tonight, and we pray that you would uphold those who seek to serve her in the ministry of the word, and that you would bless their efforts and encourage them, and, O oh God, that their labour would not be in vain in the Lord. We pray for your people that they may better learn your heart and mind and we pray that for ourselves, O oh God, that we may better know the heart and mind of God. So come to us, we pray. Grant that the Lord Jesus Christ may be altogether precious to us. 
and help us, Heavenly Father, that we may seek you and find you in this time together, because we pray to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, we're a few weeks into um, this passage that is to be found in um, John's Gospel and in chapter 15. Very famous passage, of course, where the Lord Jesus speaks of his being the vine and the Father, the vine dresser. It's quite a remarkable picture in the midst of what is really a remarkable conversation between the Lord Jesus Christ and his apostles. It's the sort of conversation that, in a sense, it would be um, wrong to listen into, completely intrusive. But wonderfully, we're actually given to hear this conversation. And as I say, key in the picture is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I am the vine, he states. The Lord Jesus Christ is the fountain. He's the origin. He's the sustainer. He's the true vine, the genuine vine. And as we've um, seen and repeated in these last few weeks, that's true in the most sweeping of terms. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one by whom the worlds were made. He made the world and all that therein is. And it's in him that we live and move and have our being. And we've emphasized that on Sunday evenings recently too. He's the life and light of the world, the source of life and being. He's the giver of life, real life, to the branches. Uh, and we can say, can't we, that you know, all um, mankind stands in need of him and of his power and of his provision in all of life. But this statement goes to the fact that he's the real source of life with God of real life. So he's the source of life in general. He's the light of the world. But he's the source of, if you like, spiritual life, life with God, of life and being, existence and relationship with God. And that's very much what he's talking about here. He's saying to his disciples, this is effectively their parting conversation, that they need him. They constantly needed to be attached to the vine. And so in the picture then we've seen the father. My father, we're told, is the vine dresser. He's pictured as the gardener, one who has an intense interest in how the vine um, and how it gets on. And we saw um, last Tuesday evening um, some talk of the branches. That will come out again in verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. But it's the image really of genuine belonging. The Lord Jesus is addressing his disciples. And uh, these that he's addressing, Judas has left, these that he's addressing are in fact genuine branches. But there are branches, people who appear to be connected, but they're, they're not really. It's the image of genuine belonging. The true branches are attached to the vine. It speaks of the importance of genuine cleansing. Because the Lord Jesus speaks here of being clean. You are already clean, verse 3, because of the word which I have spoken to you. And the point being that his true disciples, God's word had come to them. God's word had had dealings with them. It had brought them to a place of salvation and trust in our Lord Jesus Christ. They were clean. It's the same word. What you've got there is the adjective, but you've got the, the verb of the same root, Greek root, um, in verse 2, where we read, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch in me that bears fruit, he prunes, he cleans. And we noted with that then the imperative of genuine fruitfulness, because this is all about fruit. It's all about fruit. Now, we'll go a little further this evening, and we'll notice the very powerful emphasis on abiding. The Lord Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. I want to talk um, along three lines there this evening. A personal relationship, a profitable hearing, a positive speaking. A personal relationship. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to develop the idea of the need to be close to him. He's spoken of the vine, he's spoken of the vine dresser, spoken of the branches. Now he's going to speak of the need to be close to him, a personal relationship. And connected with that then, of course, 
is that we have that close relationship through the hearing of his word, a profitable hearing. And going on from there, we'll speak of a positive speaking. The fact that we hear from him through the word, but that we speak to him through prayer. And essentially, that's what a personal relationship is all about, isn't it? So those three headings then, a personal relationship, a, a profitable hearing, and a positive speaking. Let's talk first of all about a personal relationship. Now, we've seen um, in this very powerful picture the Lord Jesus Christ is drawing here for us something immediately about himself. I am the true vine. Then there's something of the Father. My Father is the gardener. He's the vine dresser. And then last time we saw something of the branches. And the branches, in, in sweeping terms, would appear to be those making some kind of a profession or other to be attached to the vine, to belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the branches here, if you like, are professing Christians. Now, that will, um, I believe, be made quite clear in verse 5. But for the moment, just notice with me this evening um, that our Lord Jesus Christ, speaking directly to the disciples, he tells them now to abide. Abide in me and I in you. Now, it's absolutely crucial um, to our understanding this evening that we think through what is going on here. The word abide there is an imperative. It's um, a command word. So you call out to the children, um, bring that here, pick that up, don't do that. They're all command words, they're all imperatives, aren't they? The word abide is the only imperative in this entire section from verse one to verse eight. All the other verbs, there are other verbs there, doing words, um, all the other verbs are essentially what you would refer to as indicatives. They're telling you how it is. They're being used to describe the situation. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. And then the command word, abide in me and I in you. Those other verbs, they're there, but they're telling you really how it is. They're being used to describe the situation. But abide is a command word. This is what the disciples, this is what we are to do. And so it's very important um, this evening to grab hold of that fact, to recognize what's going on um, in these sentences, and, and to see the key this evening in terms of how we respond to what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying. Um, there probably are other derived responses, but this is the, the commanded response, that we are to abide the Lord Jesus Christ is the genuine vine. The Father is the gardener. He's on hand and um, he takes a very lively and powerful interest in what is going on. But notice now that the Lord Jesus Christ addresses the believer's responsibility. And so he can say to these men, the Father has brought you into the vine. You are already clean. The Father is working towards cleaning you up. He's in the business of pruning. The Father is watching over the branches in that sense. But you, for your part, are to abide. The Father carefully cultivates, but we're to be careful to abide. The commentator, he puts it like this quite helpfully. He says, the responsibility of abiding in Christ is placed squarely on man's shoulders. 
And so we've got um, here something that we see oftentimes in Scripture. This is the general uh, approach uh, to us in Scripture. We've got something of a promise. God delights in his promises. He delights in giving promises. He delights in keeping promises. But with the promise, um, often we use that word covenant. With the idea of God making a, a covenant, a covenant arrangement with us, with the promise is a responsibility. And so what we've got here is abide in me and I in you, says the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we need to take that on board and we always need to take that kind of um, connection really on board. For yes, God is a, a God who makes promises and God is a God who uh, makes covenant promises and keeps his covenant arrangements, but he does expect us to respond to him. And we've a responsibility to respond to him. And it's no use our sort of throwing our hands in the air and saying, well, there we are, salvation is full and free and that's the end of it. And there's nothing for me to do and nothing for me to worry about. Well, that's not just how it is, is it? No, we've a responsibility. It's no use to throw our hands in the air. We have a responsibility. It's rather like um, that passage, and we've often alluded to this, in Philippians and in chapter 2 and verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And see the wonderful balance there in those two verses. The Philippian Christians had a responsibility to exercise themselves to godliness, to exercise themselves in the things of salvation. They were to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. Is the thought that they, from bottom up, somehow put salvation into place? No. God had put salvation into place for them. But they were to build, as it were, upon that in terms of growing, in terms of becoming fruitful. They were to work out their own salvation in that sense with fear and trembling. And then you've got the following verse. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And the point is that they were to work, but God was working in and through them. And so you've got this balance. Do we just sit back and fold our arms and say, well, God is doing it all and that's the end of it? No. No. Do we come with the idea that somehow I've got to arrange my own salvation? Well, certainly not. That's not the gospel of grace, is it? But you've got this balance. And the balance is here. The Lord Jesus says, I'm the true vine. The Father is the vine dresser. You're the branches. You have already been made clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. But you have a duty to abide in me. You need to abide in me. And be very clear as we think that through that what we've got here is very much then a personal relationship. We're to abide in him. That uh, phrase personal relationship is one that perhaps historically would have had great use. And people spoke very much of a, having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. In some ways, it's kind of open to um, a little interpretation and so on. But here's the clue to that term, personal relationship. To, to have a personal relationship is to abide in Christ. It's to, to be a branch connected to, to the vine. And so the phrase may not be so well used in Christian circles as it was in an earlier day, but the principle lying behind the phrase is no less true. To be a Christian is to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The Christian is to abide. It's to abide in me. Notice the Lord Jesus doesn't say, abide in the vine. Now that would be true wouldn't it? But that's not how he expresses it here. He says, abide in me. It's a personal relationship. Be clear about this. Becoming a Christian is bound up with 
being connected to Jesus Christ. Think of the Apostle Paul or Saul as we first meet him on the Damascus Road. And Saul, of course, is um, a Pharisee of the Pharisees and all of that stuff. And he's livid with Christians. He wants to do everything that he can to bring about the destruction of Christians and the demise of the Christian gospel and the Christian church. It's a great threat to him and to Judaism, and he wants to see it falter. He knows of Jesus Christ. He knows of the teaching of Jesus Christ. He knows of the followers of Jesus Christ. He persecutes them. He's out to persecute them. Paul had even, it would seem, just before or at some point leading up to his conversion on the Damascus Road, he had been under some kind of conviction of sin and of guilt. And so when he tells about um, his conversion and when he relates the words of the Lord Jesus, he, he, he states that the Lord Jesus had said to him, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. In other words, um, he was being pricked in his conscience. There were things that were speaking to him. He was uncomfortable. God's word had been speaking to him. Though he was so sophisticated in his Phariseeism and all the rest of it, God's word actually wonderfully had been speaking to him. He mentions that too in the book of Romans and he, he speaks there of how uh, God's word was uh, beginning to have a, a dealing with him. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it killed me. And he seems to be speaking of that process whereby God's word came to him and brought him to a sense of his guilt and wrong. Dear friend, being a Christian is about belonging to the true vine. It's not um, simply about belonging to the church. It's not, um, you know, even being a member of the church. It's about being personally connected to Jesus Christ. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's resting and trusting, depending, knowing your need of him. And so Paul, when he's brought to um, a place of conversion, he tells us then um, what this new relationship is like. It's to be found there in Philippians in chapter three. He says, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the pride of the tribe rather of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gain to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. You see, Paul is talking about coming to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's key tonight, it's key. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you in that blessed position of being able to say, my hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness? And your trust is in Jesus Christ. And it's that name of Jesus that brings a, a spring to your step. It's that uh, name of Jesus that brings um, the, the answer to your conscience and to your guilt. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, but 
but it's personal. Let's go further for a moment before we leave this point. It's a relationship. It's fellowship. And there's perhaps no better verse um, for us than in the book of Revelation in chapter 3 and verse 20. And we've often referred to this verse. It's often mis understood and misquoted the lord jesus is writing seven letters to seven churches the last of which is the church at laodicea sadly in the church in laodicea uh, there were many who thought of themselves as rich in spiritual terms but actually they were very poor the lord jesus says i am rich is what you say I have become wealthy and have need of nothing. That was the attitude, sadly, of many. But you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. What a tragedy. What a, an awful place to be. And he goes on then to, to speak of his desire for a personal relationship. Behold, I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door i will come into him and dine with him and he with me now he's he's not really speaking to the world outside he's speaking to people who profess to be christians but sadly these people had come to a place where he can describe them as being neither hot nor cold they were out of touch they felt rich but they were poor they needed the real thing. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich in white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. These people were away from the Lord Jesus Christ and not sensing their need of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's standing at the door. He longs for fellowship. He longs for a closer walk with God. He longs that they might desire him if anyone hears my voice and opens the door i will come into him and dine with him and he with me there'll be a meal there'll be a coming and going there'll be a relationship there'll be fellowship you've got that hymn i'm going to read just a part of it 555 love with everlasting love Led by grace, that love to know, spirit breathing from above, you have taught me it is so. Oh, this full and perfect peace, oh, this transport all divine in a love which cannot cease, I am his and he is mine. Heaven above is softer blue, earth around is sweeter green. Something lives in every hue, Christless eyes have never seen. Birds with gladder songs or flow, <coughs> excuse me, Flowers with deeper beauty shine, since I know, as now I know, I am his and he is mine. His forever, only his, who the Lord and me shall part. Ah, with what a rest of bliss Christ can fill the loving heart. Heaven and earth may fade and flee, firstborn light in gloom decline. But while God and I shall be, I am his and he is mine. Now that's the relationship that a, a genuine Christian has and it's being reinforced here abide in me work on that relationship be someone who is careful to walk with god is what is being said to us there tonight that's the command word that we have in this section be clear that what we have here is a personal relationship but as we begin then to try and understand what's involved in that i want to speak of a profitable hearing there's a bond there's a fellowship in that personal relationship. You remember John um, introduces his first epistle. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon on our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. He's speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship, our relationship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. He, he's longing that others may have a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship. We have this working relationship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. A relationship involves communication. It's to abide. The word simply means, it's the, the Greek word meno, it simply means to remain, to remain. I, I put to you, it involves being connected with and remaining connected with the vine, with the words that come, as it were, from this vine. How does the Lord Jesus have dealings with us. Well, how did he have those original dealings? You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. How does the Lord Jesus have those ongoing dealings with us? It's through his word. That's how he has ongoing dealings with us. It's not, um, you know, through uh, some twitchy feeling um, that makes us tingle down our back or anything like that. No, it's through his word. Is the Lord Jesus in John and chapter 8 and at verse um, 31. Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, same word, you are my disciples indeed. Key to their truly being disciples was that they would abide in his word. Later on, at verse 43, he says, Why do you not, and he's talking now not to the believing ones, but to the unbelieving ones, why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But you see, the genuine Christian believer is to be found in the truth. God's word has a lodging place in his heart. God's word speaks to him. God's word has dealings with him. And God's word comes to him. Here we are in John 5 and verse 24. Most assuredly I say to you, he who, he who hears my word and believes in him who has sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment and so on. And the point being, the person who truly belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ is the, the person who's hearing the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. The people who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, they're tied into the vine, they hear. And it's more than, you know, merely the idea of externally hearing. No, they actively listen in to what he has to say. So we've quoted from Revelation 3, but the, the, the two chapters, Revelation 2 and 3, of course, contain those seven letters to the seven churches. And there's a pattern in those um, lessons. And there are, there are things that appear in each of the, 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 the letters. And this appears in each one of the letters. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And that appears in all seven letters. It's key to hear, it's key to listen. It's key to have this dependence upon the vine, this attachment to the vine. But this attachment comes to us through the word. Think of any relationship any kind of human relationship is not going to, to last if one doesn't listen to the other. Abiding takes in hearing. The commentator, he puts it like this. He says, there is constant communication between them. There has to be communication. Think of marriage. There has to be communication, doesn't there? Um, if marriage is to last, if marriage is to be real, there's got to be communication. Husband and wife are going to communicate. They may do it in different ways. They may do it in different volumes, but there's going to be effective communication. 
And be clear that what we're talking about here has to be a real hearing. So think that through. It's hearing, but it's more than just the sound. It's truly listening. I had a conversation recently with someone, I've never met this person, but it was an important conversation. And in the course of this conversation, there were things that I had to say, but it was evident to me that um, the person was not listening, he was effectively talking over me until towards the very end, really, of the conversation when the penny seemed to drop. If you're going to have an effective conversation, if you're going to have an effective relationship in any kind of form, whether perpetual or on a casual basis, there's need to actually listen, isn't there? What we're talking about here is real hearing. It's taking on board what the Saviour says. We talked with the children recently, the, the story of Samuel. And Samuel, of course, was wonderfully born to Hannah in response to her prayer. And then in accordance with the promise that she's made, um, he's put into the temple, um, or the tabernacle rather, at that stage, with um, Eli. Eli was an old man. And uh, God's word had not been speaking to the nation for some time. And you remember that Samuel hears things in the middle of the night. And Eli realizes, though he doesn't hear, he realizes that God is speaking to Samuel. Samuel heard, Eli didn't. And that's altogether possible, isn't it? It's going to be the difference, really, between the, the real branches and what appear to be the branches. The real branches, um, to use the sort of picture they, they hear, is the, 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 the little parable of the, the sower. And we read in Matthew 13, verse 23, the explanation of the parable. He who received seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. Now, that's the only genuine Christian in the story. There are three other kinds of ground. Um, you know, the, the, the wayside where there's no hearing whatsoever. The, the, the ground that is stony, where there appears to be hearing, but it certainly doesn't last. The thorny ground, where again, there appears to be hearing, but it doesn't endure. But here's the good ground, where it's marked by hearing the word and understanding it. And that then moving into practice, it produces fruit. This abiding, well, what is it? There's a taking on board of what God's word says. Think of Amos and 3 and verse 3, perhaps the, the verse we know in the book of Amos. Um, can two walk together except they agree? The person truly connected is taking in and taking on board what God says. And so it's not, you see, just a matter of, well, I've got my Bible reading done. Tick, that's that done. No. This person is taking God's word in. And go further again. You see, it's to be fed from the vine. It's hearing, real hearing, but it's feeding. The branch is nourished by the vine. And it's enabled then to bear fruit. It's this hearing, this taking in of what God says that brings nourishment and vitality. And scripture, of course, uses that picture. And so we've, we've often, many times, alluded to First Peter and to chapter 2, where Peter says to his readers, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, hypocrisy rather, and all evil speaking, the things that can ruin our hearing of the word, our appetite for the word, as Newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And the, the point is that the, the Christian here pictured the babe, the young Christian, is anxious for milk. I guess all of us know how anxious a little one is for milk. 
Well, the Christian is described under this figure, really, of a, a newborn babe. He's anxious for milk. He wants to be fed. The genuine, growing Christian takes God's word in. He's united. He's abiding. You've got the, the picture of what ought to be the case um, in a developing Christian in, in uh, Hebrews in chapter 5, verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the principles of the oracles of God, the basic things of God's word. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The real branches take in, they grow, they bear fruit, they flourish from that sap that comes from the vine. How does the sap come to us? Well, it comes to us through the word. The children of Israel, and we've often alluded to this passage in Deuteronomy in chapter 8, verse 3, where we read, So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The experience of the children of Israel in the wilderness wanderings was a very difficult one. But it was about their learning to trust God, to take his word, to receive it, to believe it, to build their lives upon it. And the real test was, would they feed upon the word? Sadly, the older generation, for the most part, the answer was no. No. But the younger generation, wonderfully, who are being warned here, in the words of Deuteronomy, thankfully, for the most part, the answer seems to be yes. And we see that in the book of Joshua, in their obedience to God. And they seem to take God's word seriously. This personal relationship involves hearing, hearing from God. But we need thirdly and quickly to speak then of a positive speaking, because if there's a hearing from God, there's a speaking to God. And again, that's true in any relationship, isn't it? And it's true in this relationship. In a human relationship, well, we think it's unlikely to survive if it's only going to be one party doing the talking. Now, I know that you can get that sort of um, arrangement um, where you get one party who seems to do all the talking and the other one who just listens in and follows. I know you can get that sort of thing, but you could struggle to see that really as a relationship. No. This relationship involves the Christian listening, but it also involves the Christian talking in prayer. Now, we'll come back to the whole business of prayer again in verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Now, we'll come back to that, as I say, um, God willing, in time, in more detail in verse 7. But let me just say a couple of things very quickly there this evening. Notice, first of all, of course, that um, this whole business of talking to, to God um, goes with depending. Prayer, genuine prayer, is an indicator of our depending on God. It's not just a, a long list of wants, is it? It's not sort of a supermarket list. I know that we may need to make a list to keep ourselves, um, you know, remembering things that are important to remember. So I'm not taking away from that. But behind that, it must never just become that, because behind that, it, it's rooted in the very nature of the relationship between us and God. He is God. We are sinful men. We need his words. He is God. We are sinful men. We need his grace, his mercy, his help. And the person who is truly connected with the vine, he has a reason to be connected. He's been brought to see his need. We talked about Paul Saul earlier. Well, there was a time when Paul didn't really see his need. He was so full of his own answers. He was so full of him, his, his own self. But he's brought to see his need of Christ. And he sees his need to go on with Christ. 
And the genuine Christian, the branch that is connected with the vine, he knows his need. He casts all his hope on him, but he has a need day by day by day. He depends. And going on from that idea then of depending, um, we need to recognize that this relationship expresses itself in asking. That's what dependents do, isn't it? They ask. And so here's Junior. Mum, can I? And they know that um, they, they need mum to give. Dad, can I? They know that they need dad to give. The person that we've got in view here walks with God, but he talks with God. This is a, a relationship and he can ask. And the talking is two way. He hears God speak through his word, but he speaks to God through prayer. The counsel direction comes from God and the need reflected then in the asking, if you like, goes to God. You see, he's the vine and we are the branches. Dear Christian friend, we've seen that the Father wants growth, the Father wants life. And that can only be as we're in contact with the vine, in union and in communion with him. It's something that we're to work at. We've been brought wonderfully, if you're a genuine Christian tonight, well, you've been brought into this relationship with the vine. You've been brought into this relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's wonderful. It's something that God has done for you. But God expects us to work at that relationship. It's something that we're to do. The only command um, word here in this entire section of eight verses is this word abide. And we're to abide this is something that we're to actively work at. We're to abide. We're to remain. We're to tie ourselves in. We're to, we're to stay close. And it comes about as we ponder his words, as they seep into our hearts, and as they come into those hearts and unravel our twisted ways. It's to be seen in our turning to him and depending upon him day after day, seeking afresh our need made aware time after time of our sin and left casting ourselves upon him. The Lord Jesus says, I'm the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. You're effectively the branches. Abide in me. You need to be there abiding in me. And it's a command word and it belongs to each and every Christian. And it's something that we need to work at. We need to abide in the vine, to abide in our Lord Jesus Christ. And can I leave you very quickly at the end then with that question? Uh, do you have a genuine personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Because it's not, as we've seen in recent weeks, something that's in name. It's a personal relationship. It's a genuine faith. It's a, it's a living dependence, a living listening, if you like to Jesus Christ. You have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We're going to turn to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how it searches us out, how it speaks to us, how it points us to our need of the Lord Jesus. We pray, O oh God, that for each and every one of us, we may find our need met in him, that we may see that we need him day by day, that we may know that he's the vine, we're the branches, and that we may remain in him. Come to us, have gracious dealings with our hearts, we pray, and remember us for Jesus' sake. Amen.